Well, it's a cool crisp morning here in North Florida. And as you can see, there's an intersection over there, which serves as a good lead in and illustration for the lesson we're gonna look at today. You see, everywhere you drive, you're gonna run into roads that intersect with one another. And today we're gonna look at an even more important intersection. It's the intersection of grace, faith, and works. We're gonna look at an ensemble of scriptures, particularly in James, where the phrase, by faith only, appears, but it doesn't say we're saved by faith only. He's in a discussion about Abraham and the works that Abraham did. So as we've always said, if you're not careful, you might just learn something before we're done. So get your Bibles and let's get started. Uh, we'll go inside where it's a little bit warmer. Everybody remember this guy? <clears throat> Jack Abramoff, name ring any bells? Got caught up uh, towards the end of Bush 43's administration in a corruption and bribery scandal where he and about 20 members of Congress either pled guilty or were found guilty of uh, various corruption charges uh, that he had set up to get favorable treatment for various bills and that kind of thing that were pending uh, before Congress. Now, we always get pretty upset when we see somebody trying to buy off a politician, don't we? Especially if it's of the other guy's party. If it's my party, it's not so bad. But if it's your guy, hey, we got a problem. But we get <clears throat> typically get outraged, and there have been congressmen and senators who've been voted out of office. And we should get upset when we see people trying to buy off elected officials and that kind of thing. But have you ever thought about when we try to buy off God? Well, how do we do that? Well, what about people who pretty much ignore God, but they just want to show up uh, at, at the pearly gates one day and just have God say, you're good enough, you gave enough money, you, you did enough good deeds, I'm going to bring you into heaven. That's basically what we're doing, isn't it? Here's a song that was popular a few years back. Uh, if you're a country music fan and Kenny Chesney, you may remember this song. Uh, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. Have a look at the words. The preacher told me last Sunday morning, son, you better start living right. You need to quit the women and whiskey and carrying on all night. <clears throat> Don't you want to hear them call your name when you're standing at the pearly gates? I told the preacher, yes, I do, but I hope they don't call today. I ain't ready to go. Everybody wants to go to heaven, have a mansion high above the clouds. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. Now, what, look at this. Said, the, said preacher, maybe you didn't see me throw an extra 20 in the plate. That's one for everything I did last night and one to get me through the today. Here's a 10 to help you remember next time you got the good Lord's ear. Say I'm coming, but there ain't no hurry. I'm having fun down here. Don't you want to know that? Someday I want to see those streets of gold in my halo, and I wouldn't mind waiting at least a hundred years or so. Everybody wanting to go to heaven, it beats the other place, there ain't no doubt. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. But notice, I threw an extra 20 in the plate, and here's another 10 to help you remember. Basically trying to buy God, or at least buy the preacher, so that he'll put in a good word for me with God. And I'm trying to impress God with what I have given. But it doesn't work that way. We many times, many people will be just like this with God. They don't want to hear what God has to say. But somehow I expect God to be there for me. I expect God to take the extra 20 I put in the plate and to keep that under consideration when I stand up there uh, before him uh, in heaven. But see, God expects us to live faithfully all the time here. Not just when we want something. Not like a teenager who may come in and they've mowed the lawn and done an extra good job. Why? Because they want the car Friday night for their date. See, there are works are important, but not to buy off God, not to impress God. The reason why we do good works is because we are a Christian and I want to obey God. And what I want to look at today is this intersection that we have between the, the works and between grace and between faith. Last week we looked at grace in the sense of the woman caught in adultery. 
and how the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who should have known better, uh, didn't get it. And they came to Jesus wanting uh, to test him and to try him. Remember that. They, the teachers in that lesson went to school. And Jesus taught them a lesson that I don't think any of them forgot. But today, if you notice, we've got this three-way fork here where grace and faith and works are all going to come together and converge. And, and that's what I want us to see. We can't just show up like the song we just looked at uh, uh, says, that uh, I'm just going to show up and go to heaven one day and all that, that extra 20 I put in the plate, yeah, that should be worth something. It's not going to work that way. And I, I want us to understand that God's grace is extended to everybody. The offer is there. But is everybody going to accept it? See, God took the first step in reconciling us to Him. Remember, it was Adam and Eve who broke the, the, uh, the relationship, broke the chain, if you will, between man and God. And it's just been going downhill ever since. And so God took the first step for us to be reconciled to Him. Uh, Titus chapter 2, he says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age. You see, what God wants us to do is to live godly lives and self-controlled and upright in this present age. To be faithful all the time. And not just do good deeds every now and then in hopes that uh, you know, I'll get a little check mark and then I can show up to God and God will say, oh yeah, you did all these things and yeah, okay, that'll outweigh the, uh, the bad things. That's not what, what he's wanting us here. God's grace is offered to everyone. If we have accepted it, then we should be living a self-controlled life. But of course, not everybody accepts it. We all get these ads in the mail, don't we, or in our paper? Who are they for? Well, they're for anyone who wants it. God's grace is like these ads. Uh, where does this come from? This is a Piggly Wiggly ad. Uh, if you don't want the two for five dollar ragu spaghetti sauce, you don't have to take it. Nobody's going to come to your house and drag you into Piggly Wiggly and make you take that offer. Or whatever this is, looks like saving a dollar off some kind of meat. Now, that might be fish. I don't know. can't tell. It's kind of blurry. But nobody's going to make you take it. God is not going to make you take his offer of grace. It is there for those who want to uh, accept it. And our good works do not bring about God's grace. We have God's grace because of his love towards mankind. Because God has, has uh, sent Jesus, Jesus paid the price for my sins, I want to live faithfully to God. I want to do it all the time, not just on Sundays. I want to make sure that I am dead to sin. If you look at Romans chapter 6, he makes, Paul makes the point there that we are to be dead to sin. Now, I've been to some funerals uh, and preached a few and attended uh, more than I've preached. I have never seen anybody go up. I mean, I've seen people go up to the coffin and they put their hand on the, you know, they put their hand on the hand of, the, of grandma or grandpa or whoever's in the coffin. But I have never seen that body react. Why? Well, it's dead. The life is gone. That's the way we are to be to sin. Sin should have no effect on us. But unfortunately, being human, we still struggle with it. But we should make sure that we are, are, are fighting back. We are saying no to ungodliness like he encouraged Titus to do. God's grace wants action that will lead us to deny ungodliness. To say no to it. He says, deny ungodliness. Deny worldly desires. Live sensibly. Live righteously. Live godly. You know, think about it. Think about what God wants us to do. Think about what the Bible says about how we are to live. That's, that's what he wants. You remember back in the 80s when uh, those of us who, are, who you know, were around then, you remember the anti-drug campaign that Nancy Reagan had? What was it? Anybody remember? Just say no. Yeah, just say no. Kind of simplistic, people thought. But guess what? It works eventually. If you just say no, I'm not going to do it. Bye, see ya. And that's exactly what... Grace teaches us to do with ungodliness. Say no. I'm not going to do that. I'm a Christian now. I am dead to sin. I'm not going to allow that to have any influence on me. I am going to uh, live for God uh, now. Grace does not give you the license to live as you want, said one writer. It gives you the liberty to live the way you ought to. I am now free in Christ to serve God and do all the good that I want. I am not bound uh, by sin anymore. Sin is, is dead, to, or rather, I am dead to sin. Sin is not going to have any, uh, any effect on me. 
And so just say, we have to say no to sin. Grace teaches us to live according to the standard of God's righteousness, which does require us to do something, which requires us to say no, which requires us to do the works, the deeds, the things that God wants us to do so that grace, faith, and action will converge together uh, in our lives. Ephesians chapter 2. It is obedient faith that we, that we need to have. The, God's grace offers salvation to us, but we have to do something to accept it. Now, he says in there, by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works. What's he talking about? Look at it in context. He is talking about works of merit. I cannot do enough good things to put God into my debt, like the song was trying to do. God, hey, I'm going to put another 20 in the plate. I got an extra 10, that should uh, make up for last night, shouldn't it? I often wonder what God thinks when, uh, about our attempts to, to buy him off like that. You know, Bill Gates, supposedly, you know, he's the richest man in the world. You think he, he could buy off God? You think God's going to be impressed with that amount of money? I mean, I, you might be impressed. I'm certainly impressed with the money he's got. And, and, and the money that, that a Donald Trump would have or any other billionaire. But God who created the world, Psalm says he owns the, the cattle on a thousand hills. And, and the, you look at the description of heaven, you think God's really going to be impressed? Hmm. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, probably not. Probably not. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope for the glory of God uh, rejoice in hope of the glory of God and not only that but we also glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance so perseverance or patience comes out of our tribulation in Romans chapter 5 we see because of what Jesus did we have a, a life of hope we can have that hope because of the price he paid. While we were helpless and living uh, uh, evil lives, Christ died for us. A few uh, verses later, he's going to talk about how we were once enemies with God. But because of what Jesus did, we can have that reconciliation with God. Paul's given us ample proof. And when you go through Romans, remember Romans chapter 1, he's talking to... Uh, to uh, non-Jews, to Gentiles, chapter 2, he's talking to the Jews. In the beginning in chapter 3, he's talking to everybody. And he's going to tell us here, first of all, if you go through chapter 5, he makes the case we need justification. And then he makes the case that uh, we are justified by faith, and then that man needs to be justified by faith because he's going to, uh, as following the example of Abraham. And we're going to look at Abraham here in just a minute. So do you have peace with God? This, because this is how we have it. It's because of what Jesus did for us. Because we couldn't uh, come up to the standard that God needed. That's why Jesus was sent. And because of grace, people in the Old Testament acted out of faith. Now, we typically associate grace with the New Testament, don't we? And years ago, I was having a conversation with someone, and we got to talking about grace. And he said, you do realize that grace is not just a New Testament concept. I thought about that, and I said, no, I don't think I've ever thought about that. He said, yeah, and he pointed me to this scripture that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. So I did a little, little looking up at it, uh, into it, and, and to see what it said, and realized God showed grace because he didn't have to save Noah. He could have uh, put anybody else in, but he, he, he chose Noah and his family. He didn't have to do it, so that was grace. It was an unmerited favor. He came to Noah and told him about what was going to happen and said, now you need to build this ark. And you need to get all the animals on. Get your wife, get your kids, get your, their, their wives in there. I'm freely paraphrasing. But he chose Noah. And the fact that Noah, though, was to do something did not negate God's grace. Noah was not doing something to earn God's grace or to earn God's favor. God came and said, Noah, I'm going to flood the world. I'm going to destroy it. Now I need you to build this ark. Here's the measurements. I need you to uh, get the animals there and get them into it. And then I need uh, you and your family in because the earth is, this is it. The earth is going to be destroyed. 
Now, we mentioned in, in class uh, that the man that I knew years ago who just basically wanted to go sit in a field and thought God would take care of him and he didn't have to do anything. If, Mo if Noah had sat there and said, uh, yeah, okay, I hear you, God, but um, I think I'm just going to sit in the field over there and I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to trust God to build this ark. You remember the Bill Cosby routine about Noah? How long can you tread water? Uh, Noah would have treaded water for quite a while if he had just sat there. But grace told him what he needed to do, and then he carried it out. He was not saved until he obeyed what God taught him, what God told him to do. He, uh, until he actually went and built the ark. He was not saved until that point. And because God extended grace to Noah, Noah wanted to obey God. You know, God extended grace to me, so now I want to obey God. I want to do as God wants me to. Not just be baptized and then walk away from it and go live back into what I was doing before. I, I want to change my, my direction in life. I want to do things different now because God uh, sent Jesus in my place. Hebrews chapter 11, grace gave that warning. Faith took the action. And notice it was Noah's faith caused him to act on something he couldn't see. In the first uh, five chapters of Genesis, uh, you don't see anything about rain or floods. And that's led uh, a lot to conclude that there had been no rain or, or flood or anything like that up to that point. So when God came and said, I'm going to flood the world, I need you to build this ark, very good possibility Noah really didn't know anything about what God was talking about. He had not seen it. But he acted in faith to do as God wanted him to do. It's kind of like our, our military. He volunteered. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And that's the way our military is. It's all volunteer. The last conscript retired in about 2011, I think. Everybody there is there because they chose that uh, as their career field or as their, as their job. Which also gets to why somebody like a Bill Gates, who does a lot. When I was in Rotary, uh, it was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that put a lot of money into uh, getting polio vaccines to Africa and India and places like that. And uh, so you mean to tell me Bill Gates with all that isn't going to heaven? Well, has Bill Gates volunteered? Has he stepped up and said he wants to be a Christian and wants to serve God? As far as I know, he hasn't. And that's why you can do all the good works you want because you have not, and not go to heaven because you have not actually volunteered yourself like Noah did. Noah uh, volunteered when God came to him and said, here's what I need you to do. He did it. Which is also what Abraham did. He received grace and displayed faith. How did he do it? Well, because he went out and did as God told him to do when God said, beginning in Genesis 12, just go and um, uh, uh, get your things together and go to a land and I'll show you when you get there, you want me to go where? I'll tell you when you get there. Okay, now I've imagined him and Noah both when they go home to their wives. And Noah, you know, came in, uh, I got to build this boat. You got to do what? And Abraham comes into his wife, okay, uh, Sarah, um, God spoke to me and said that we're to pack up and we're to go. Okay, where, where are we going? Well, he didn't tell me. He said he would, you know, we'll know when we get there. Huh. I wonder what was going through their wives' minds when, when that happened. But they all packed up, and Abraham went and did what he was supposed to do. Noah did what he was supposed to do. And then we see this in the book of Hebrews. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs of him uh, of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham was stepping out uh, in faith. It was obedient faith to fulfill what God has said. He was caused him to move. He, he went out and did it as God said for him. That that's the secret of Abraham's faith. His hope was in the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises. Back up a little bit from uh, that verse in Hebrews chapter 11 where it tells us God cannot lie in chapter 6. God, if God says it, you know it's going to happen. Is there something God can't do? As a matter of fact, there is something God can't do. God can't lie. God can't do anything that is outside His nature. Grace made an offer to Abraham. It was faith that accepted it. Obedient action. Abraham, pack up and go. Okay. Obedient action. Let's get all our stuff together and let, let's hit the road. And then James, 
It tells us, uh, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? Whoops. See, Abraham and Noah, both of them are examples of faith. And then notice this, the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. When someone says, hey, you're saved by faith only, point out to the, them out to this. James chapter 2, verse 24. This is the only place where faith only appears in Scripture. And if you'll notice, it's negated. We are not saved by faith only. Abraham was justified by works, not works of merit, but works of obedience. Because he did what God told him to do, just like Noah did. They both stepped out on faith, did what God told them to do. It was obedient faith that caused them to uh, do as God wanted them to. And then Naaman, a Gentile soldier, captain in the Syrian army. And he's got leprosy. But he's also got an Israelite slave girl who says, you know, it's too bad my master can go back home. There's this prophet back there who could help you. And he's probably no doubt tried everything else. Leprosy was pretty serious in Leviticus, beginning in chapter 13. Anybody who has leprosy, their clothes have to be burned. They have to go outside the camp. It's, it was pretty serious business. And he no doubt has probably tried everything. Well, okay. Problem is, we're not exactly friends with Israel right now. Well, it's okay. The king writes him a letter. Here you are. Go. So he goes off, ends up there uh, at Elisha's house. And then Elisha tells him what he needs to do. This captive girl, captive Isra Israelite girl. He listened to her. Oh, okay, maybe I need to go and talk to this prophet guy. But see, what Naaman shows us is that God, Jehovah, is not just a tribal or a local God. That's how they used to think of gods then. You know, my country, uh, we've got our gods, our religion, you've got yours. And when we go to war, if I defeat you, that's because my God was better than your God that day. That's basically what it would come down to. But Naaman, not being of the Jewish nation or of the, of the Jewish faith, shows when he went to Elisha and was cured, shows that, hey, this God that the, the, they have must be the God, the universal God that's over everything. See, Naaman wanted to be too, treated like a great man who was a leper. See, he went to Elisha, and Elisha just sent someone out to him and said, go dip in the Jordan seven times. Wait a minute, why didn't he even come out here to me? Doesn't he know who I am? Doesn't he know that I'm in, uh, in the, be uh, the biggest army, toughest army in the world, and I'm, I'm high-ranking? But N Elisha treated him like a leper who just happened to be a great man. Doesn't matter, you're a leper. Doesn't matter what you've accomplished. Go wash yourself now in the Jordan seven times. And we all know he blew a gasket over that. God's grace tells us, though, to push aside those surface differences. Okay, he's a great man in the army. Yes, yeah, so what? Again, you want to impress God? That's not going to impress God. You want to impress God with your money? You really think that's going to do anything? See, Christianity also has us push aside these differences in and, their and, and treatment and, and care of others. Push that aside. Doesn't matter what nationality you are. Doesn't matter what race. Doesn't matter how much money you've got. None of that matters to God. What's going to matter is, are you, are you a Christian? Do you have the blood of Jesus covering your sins? And we as individuals take action to, to accept or to reject the cure for sin, just like Naaman did. He got all upset. Why should I go dip in the Jordan River? You want me to do that, that sewer? There's other rivers I could dip in. Why, why this one? And you notice the cooler heads got a hold of him and said, well, wait a minute. Let's think about this. Suppose you had been told to go do something great. Maybe lead some army into battle or, or uh, 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 put up some money to build a new hospital wing. You'd have done that, wouldn't you? Well, yeah. Well, how simple is this? Yeah, I guess it is. It's the same thing we do today with the plan of salvation. How simple is it or how hard is it? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. How hard is that? And then notice in verse 15 there of uh, 2 Kings 5, Naaman has a natural human reaction. He wants to pay Elisha for what he did. You know, you do something for me and 
And uh, I said, what, what can I pay you something for? When I, when I went uh, last week to have a, a tire, had a tire issue with, with uh, our vehicle, I took it into discount tire. They uh, put a patch on it, brought it around front. And I said, okay, what do I owe? He said, nothing. He said, we don't charge for that. But of course I wanted to pay him for it, just like Naaman wanted to pay uh, Elisha. Natural human reaction, but you cannot pay God for anything. You cannot buy anything that God uh, has, has uh, given us. And because of grace, then people in the New Testament, of course, obey by faith. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when they had heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now you stop right there and you see what the question is. Very simple question. What do we need to do? And then Peter gives them an answer. To repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the promises to you and to your children and all who are far off and as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Notice it was uh, that the Lord added daily. You don't have to wait till a Sunday or till a Wednesday. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided among all as he, they had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. The Lord adds daily. See, the people who listened to Peter that day received grace when they did what Peter told them to do. Not because they were earning it, but because they wanted to obey God. Jesus poured out his blood for our sins when we are immersed we come in contact with that blood. And notice it was a command. It's an imperative. It was an order. But humans like to make things difficult. We're like Naaman. That's all? Uh, 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 just, just go dip in the Jordan seven times? Uh, uh, phew, that's a filthy river. Can I do it in another river? Uh, you mean I have to be baptized? No, that's, that can't be it. Can I just say a prayer? Can I just put an extra 20 in the plate? That we want to do something other than what God says. We want to do something on our terms. That's what Naaman wanted. Versus Abraham or Noah who simply said, okay, God, here's, I'll, I'll do it. That's what you want me to do. But Naaman, no, I want it on my terms. I want to pay for it. Humans, I want salvation on my terms. I don't want to have to go to church. I don't want to have to live faithfully. I want to be able to just do some good deeds and then show up on God's doorstep. See, baptism is not a work we do to buy off God. It is an act of faith. I can't buy God by anything I do. I cannot put him into my debt. I simply do as God says uh, for me to do. Many denominations are, are, uh, uh, accuse us of believing in water regeneration. But that's not it. The fact is that baptism is simply an act of faith. It is simply an act of obedience. We cannot tell God that we have faith if we're not going to do what he says. We don't have faith if we're not going to do uh, as God tells us to do. We are baptized because God extends grace to us. And we want to obey God. It's that simple. Oh, you mean I can't buy my way? No, you can't. Oh, uh, uh, something that simple? I'm not, I don't have to go do any great physical feat or a great military or political feat? No. Just simply do as He wants us to do. Grace teaches us what we have to do and we respond by Faithful actions, obedient action, like Naaman did, like, like uh, uh, Abraham, like Noah. That's what grace does for us. It, it causes us. God sent Jesus to pay my, the price that I couldn't pay for my sin, so I am going to uh, live as he wants me to. And if you do not obey what grace teaches in the New Testament, you're going to end up like they would have if they had not obeyed. What if Moses... Uh, or not Moses, but Abraham had said, well, yeah, God, I believe it. I'm just going to stay right here. Well, that would have, look, look at what Abraham's descendants did. Would his descendants have been able to do that? Well, no, not from there. What about Noah? Noah, yeah, I believe you, but I'm just going to sit here on the ground and, and uh, uh, let the ark build itself, or I'm just going to wait and let God do it. 
Or if he did, God, yeah, I believe you, but now nah, I just don't want to build that ark. I want to go do something else. And that's what people today, be baptized, have my sins forgiven? Nah, I don't want to do that. See, grace is what saves us, yes. But because God extended grace to us, from that point forward of our, of our conversion to Christ, we need to live faithfully. We should want to. It should come down to my desire is to serve God. Have you noticed how easy, much easier it is to do things we want to do versus things we have to do? You know, over the next couple of months, how many of us are going to have to sit down and get our taxes together? Anybody really want to do that? Hmm, I don't see too many hands going up. We have to do that. How many of us, though, are, want to go to the beach on a warm day or go to our favorite vacation spot or our favorite restaurant. Hey, I like that. I want to do that. I can do that all day, all week. It's because I want to. Do you want to serve God faithfully? Then that's, that's going to make it a lot easier if you desire it. So this morning, if we can help you, do you desire it? Are you walking faithfully as you should? If you're not, then let us, let us help. Be like Abraham and Noah and the people on Pentecost and serve God faithfully. Receive God's grace and desire to serve Him. Don't be like Naaman and argue with God and fuss with God. Yeah, he came around eventually, but he was wanting to do it his way. Let's live humbly for the Lord. Let's live humbly out of obedient faith for Him. And if we can help you this morning, let us know as together we stand and as we sing. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dried. We're marching through Emmanuel's crown.